a very good afternoon everyone so uh, this talk is about uh, securing third party applications at scale uh, so before i get started uh, uh, some of the key takeaways so uh, we'll be covering uh, some topics on how to build an effective uh, third party application process especially if you are a fast growing small or medium scale company this is very helpful or if you have a company which is which has a well uh, established third party process you could compare yours to what we have for salesforce and then uh, we'll be touching in parallels with uh, the security review process for uh, salesforce uh, app exchange and then uh, i'd be going over some importance of uh, storing uh, all the review data and what we have uh, figured out in, inside salesforce how we make use of the data and then uh, some of the existing open source tools that's available in the market to help you get uh, kick started with the process uh so who are we uh, i'm prashant kanan uh, i work with the salesforce uh, product security team i'm security engineer for salesforce uh, health and uh, financial cloud i report to uh, ryan flood here uh, that's my tagline <laughs> i'm a quarian by choice and an aquarian by birth i know it sounds funky I spent a lot of time reading on a website called Quora. That's all. Uh, Quarian. <laughs> yeah, and I'm Ryan Flood. I lead security for the App Exchange team. Um, frankly, while I like the technical work and the actual finding bugs, fixing bugs, um, we're going to be talking a lot about process today. Which actually, if you don't get the process right, the technical stuff goes to waste. So um, I feel like we should actually have. Two more pictures on here. If you didn't get a chance to see the lightning talk from Slack, that was an awesome talk. You should go home, watch that on YouTube. Um, they do it in a very short amount of time. They cover a lot of the stuff we're going to be covering today. We're going to go in depth and uh, expand on them. But tell me what the App Exchange is, Prashant. Yeah, of course. Uh, so the Salesforce App Exchange was started uh, in the year 2005. so it's a portal where uh, any developer around the world can uh, write app and uh, sell it to a uh, existing salesforce customer it's uh, similar to uh, play store in android or uh, app store in apple uh, so uh, we have our own proprietary language uh, apex uh, visual force and then lightning where people can write code in that language and they can integrate to their uh, third party uh, endpoint or you have complete uh, third party web application stack which which they build an integration to uh, salesforce we have different types of application we have almost uh, 5000 plus uh, application every application uh, that's in the market uh, went through a manual security review uh, there are some apps uh, which are uh, simple web application uh, some complex uh, mobile application there are also apps uh, interesting apps which connect to printers uh, uh now regarding third party application there are different types i mean uh you have uh, uh internal enterprise related uh, third party application needs like you have a, a hr department who want to use a third party application to store uh, employee information or you have uh, your uh, supply chain team having vendor related information uh and then or you could have your product development team your developer uh, your uh, developers are using uh uh third party libraries in our product development uh, or the case of in case of salesforce app exchange where we have uh, a third party developer developing apps and selling to you to your customers uh, so there are a couple of challenges with it because it's going to be someone else code which you totally don't have access to uh, and then uh, testing is a very hu huge challenge uh, sometimes they might give you a production environment and then uh, you might uh, break stuff uh so that's a huge challenge and then uh, you can only test their product you cannot evaluate their process usually some companies uh, don't have a proper uh, secure development life cycle with them so usually security is off uh, after thought in certain companies and then uh, you would find more security vulnerabilities uh, uh, likely and then uh, you would also have pressure from internal and external sources i know everyone here will agree with that your uh, internal developer saying when we're going to when you're going to uh, approve the library or um, uh, you have your external sales team who's trying to uh, uh, push their application to you and then there's always been an environment that you can never control uh, uh, for example you would have reviewed a web application on one particular version 
but uh, uh, a month later they would build more features and then uh, it becomes more challenging and so that uh, uh, some vulnerability might be introduced to uh, now I'll hand it over to Ryan to uh, go over. Yeah, uh, so I live in San Francisco, and one thing you learn about San Francisco is that it's extremely expensive, and you're constantly looking for a better, better deal. And frankly, I was apartment hunting recently, and it's all actually pretty similar to what we do. Um, when you're looking at buying a house or looking at an apartment, you get the finished product. You get to look at the door, you check the locks work, you know that you're on a busy street. You might not know that there's a bus route that runs there, literally all night, and you're gonna be woken up at 1 a.m. You only get to see it in its best light. This is a pretty hard problem, and so you have to come up with ways to look at it, not only in its best light, but as it's being used. So we've built a pretty high-level process here for what we do. And a lot of it actually starts with defining the problem. Um, we can do a lot of security work, and we can just solve a bunch of small security things. Knock these bugs out of here, knock these bugs out of here. But unless you have an end goal in mind and what's in and out of scope, a lot of your work's gonna go to waste. Um, once you have that, you need to start baselining, grabbing all of the documents, getting all the environments together, deciding what's this tall to ride to even start participating in the security process and working with your security team. Um, you don't really get any real security though until you do the assessment. You might get buy-in from the teams, you might get them starting to push, push it together, but at some point you need to actually knock down risk with an assessment and of course remediation. Hopefully you don't do this too much because everyone has built secure products, but I think we all know we're gonna do a few rounds of that. Um, there's a hidden step here that I don't put up there because I'm a security engineer, I'm a security team, which right here is a launch actually, where your part as a security team is done. But you need to monitor that ongoing. They're selling, they are onboarded to your internal employees, whichever process you're working with for your third parties. You need to make sure that you're actually watching what they're doing, understanding how the environment changes around you and use that to redefine your problem. We're gonna go into how we do that. And then of course, I went to the dentist six months ago. It's about time for another checkup. Um, security's never done, as we all know. Sometimes it's time to really dig back into what we've done before. But what have we done and what are we trying to do? When we define the problem, we have to define what's in and out of scope. At Salesforce, we defined the app exchange. This is code that you can install into your org integrations that can play with your Salesforce data. Um, there is things that are out of scope. We care about mash distribution. If you are building an app for your two Salesforce orgs, if you're building an app for your East Coast and your West Coast accounts, and you just want to install that between the two, it doesn't make sense for us to get in the way of that. You're building it yourself, you know your needs best. We're not gonna stop that. But once you know who your audience is, define their space they play in. That's it. What are the actual data they need access to? And if you can, can you technically control that? Can you build it into your APIs? Can you build it into your network accesses for what data is protected and how? Um, I always prefer policy controls, or excuse me, technical controls over policy controls. It's very hard to circumvent technical controls. And if that does happen, that's usually a form of insider threat. So you might have a bigger problem. But at Salesforce, we've defined the mass distribution as what we care about most. And we have built our technical controls into our languages and API. We have our own programming languages, Apex, Visual Force, Lightning, Lightning Web Components. These have the bounds on the data built in. There's still ways that you can abuse your privilege if you ha are in those languages, but you can't break out of the sandbox that we've put you in. But we also wanna make sure that we're open and transparent with our customers for what is and what is not a part of this process. So we have an install warning for apps which we haven't reviewed, 
We don't want to give the customer any idea that we've done any diligence on their behalf. They need to do it themselves. But in order for us to start onboarding and start having the ability to remove that warning, we need to baseline. We need to get people ready for our own process. And you need to think about what you want to collect. Do you want to collect certs? I know at Slack, the Slack talk, they asked if certs were relevant. I want to ask that question again. Do we think certs are security? This is interactive, people. Raise your hand. No? <laughs> yes? Certs aren't nothing. I think certs show an organizational commitment to security. You paid this much for it. Someone cares about security in some sense. I don't trust them by themselves, though. And as you go through an ongoing life cycle, you need to come up with vulnerability disclosure guidelines, remediation SLAs, and figure out what's your risk tolerance for an ongoing partnership of security, not just a one-time relation or one-time uh, interaction. Once you have defined this process and defined this bar, tattoo it on your forehead. You want to make sure it's as easy as possible to understand. At Salesforce, we put our requirements checklist out very publicly. We want everyone to know what it takes to work with us. It saves me a lot of communication time. It saves Prashant a lot of communication time. Um, and we actually have taken it directly to our customers, too. So we have a gamified learning platform at Salesforce called Trailhead, where you learn a lot about what Salesforce is, how to use the product. We put our security content right into there so people can stumble across it accidentally. They don't have to go looking for security content. Security content comes to them. We have a walkthrough wizard when, as you're submitting for the business process, we've injected it into there. Um, we also bring security content to our customers and co-resident with our docs. Has anyone here been to Dreamforce before? Very large conference. Has anyone here suffered in the San Francisco traffic because of Dreamforce? <laughs> well, I'm a part of that, and I was teaching security there, so thank me, I think. Um, we bring it everywhere our customers are. But here's the fun part. Here's where we get to do the hacking. Here's where we get to actually fix stuff when we assess the individuals. Um, you can do it yourself. You can outsource it. If you outsource it, I'd recommend at least reviewing that yourself. Um, but you need to define your security bar, which we've done, and you need to measure against it. But I don't want to be responsible for all security all the time. We've built some self-service tools at Salesforce for you to come scan your code. We have a pretty public relationship with Checkmarks, um, who's also a sponsor of this. Uh, take your vendors who you work with very well. Take your favorite open source projects and put those out as things you trust. Put those out as, as tools they can use. And one thing that we've been learning more and more is security terms of service or contract terms. Um, as you have the ongoing life cycle, you need to hold people accountable for security. You need to say, we've found this bug in it. You're not responding to us. This is what's going to happen to you. And we do that. We do a very proactive security posture for the app exchange. We have our relationship with check marks to provide static analysis. We've put security pretty much in every step of the partner development process. And remediation, of course. Hopefully, you get to skip this step. If not, we learn a lot about a company and their commitment to security through their remediation process. Whether it's how well they fix bugs, um, what questions they ask, what do I need to do to pass is not a great question. How does this bug work is a better question. Um, how they fix bugs, we've seen lots of people try and fix cross-site scripting by just removing the script tag. You're working on it, and it's good to see forward movement. Um, we actually get to treat that as a learning opportunity and teach them the broader scope and advertise some tools. We have some open source tools for present, preventing cross-site scripting. So look up secure filters if you have the chance. Um, but we do a lot of this through our support. So we have office hours. We have more gamified learning content for technical content. I was actually told this is some of the best but hardest training on our gamified learning platform. 
which is great to hear. Um, also terrible to hear because it means we're not doing a good job teaching security. Um, but when we do run apps through this remediation process, we return something like this. We return a detailed report leaning on industry best practice documents. Thank you so much, OWASP, for all the documentation you have. Um, we do specific examples where we show the code snippets, we talk about what happened. Um, and one thing that you might find out as you go through a few remediation loops is you might have people who try and brute force the process. We've built some disincentives into our process around longer waiting times, around changing our relationship with these partners um, if they aren't participating in good faith with us. And I would highly recommend for your relationship, for your target audience, figure out what's important to them and make sure that that's tied to the status of their security. But we're done, we've fixed all the issues, we're good. It's time to just watch the ecosystem, see what grows, see what happens. One thing that I've learned is that it's very hard to keep track of data. Data breaches, obviously, but it's very easy just to lose data. So take inventory of your third parties based on the thing that the business cares about most. Whether it's the listing, whether it's the contracts, whether it's the privileged tokens that are not gonna get lost because if they get lost, that business falls apart. Use that as your primary key to index all of your security information off of. Review information, how much things have changed, what automated tools you can get out. But not only the security information, but general business information. Are they only selling to our highly regulated customers or are only our salespeople using this product? How many and what amount of data is going to this? Anything you can collect, do collect. And actually, feed that back to your problem. At Salesforce, um, we've built a really strong, powerful programming language called Apex. In the, entrance, in the interest of flexibility, we allow that to run as admin. One thing we noticed is that developers weren't doing that automatically. They built their code, but they didn't always consider security. Through internal data on how many vulnerabilities we've prevented through our app exchange process, as well as some pressure from outside, we've actually built CRUD and FLS enforcement into the product. We've guided the product decisions based on the marketplace response. This is a huge win for us. Um, this is a great way to show need for security features instead of just secure features. Um, if anyone knows about this, I'd love to talk about it. Currently, the enforced CRUD and FLS and Apex is in developer beta, but it's some really cool stuff. Lastly, security's never done, we all know that. I didn't brush my teeth and have perfect teeth. Uh, you need to build cutoff bars or risk-based re-reviews to figure out when it's time to do another checkup, whether it's a certain amount of time, a certain dollar impact to your business, or just a certain amount of risk change, whether it's code, whether it's API shape. Um, checkups are really great in driving down risk, they allow you to apply new security policies back to the retroactive, uh, retroactively approved, grandfathered in apps. Um, if you want to deprecate old protocols, if you want to get rid of old technologies, this is the way to do it. Um, I was just in Europe recently and I was looking at a bunch of castles and state of the art security used to be castles, right? You'd come over, you'd have your knights, they'd bang on the wall, but you were safe. And then we had cannons, which knocked that out. I argue this is the same thing for security. We need to have security checkups because eventually someone builds a cannon and blows away TLS 1.0. So at Salesforce, we do have that. We do have app exchange re-reviews. We have a mature process for incident response. Being a big company with a very visible face, people will report security bugs that don't belong to you, but impact you, to you. We have a way to actually drive that remediation even though it's not our code. We have ongoing security scans as new versions are launched, and new platforms act as triggers to help re-review old, old code. 
We launch new platforms all the time. Some of you may have seen we're launching a new developer platform, Lightning Web Components. I'm very excited about that. We're going to do a lot of security review around that too. But Prashant, I talked about what to do. Yep. How do I make it good? Yeah, let's make uh, CCP review great again. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, of course. Uh, now we've built a process. Now there are a couple of challenges. You have uh, cost and time. Uh, so uh, by following some of these steps, uh, you could drive down your cost and time too. Uh, one of these is uh, analyzing your data uh, to uh, uh, improve your process overall. Uh, I'll go over that in specifically. Uh, and then uh, evangelizing your process, like Ryan said, you have a baseline that you have already set. Now you have to keep uh, selling it to your uh, third party providers, both internally and uh, externally. And uh, automation, automation saves a lot of time. Uh, I'll go over some uh, open source tool that's available in the market. And then uh, it's very important to have an operation team also to handle uh, some of the requests. Uh, over time, as the number of requests uh, keeps climbing up, uh, it would be very difficult for the engineering team to handle those requests. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, as I said uh, earlier, uh, storing, managing, and uh, reviewing data on uh, all the third party applications provide uh, very valuable insight. Uh, imagine you have uh, review information pa for past one year then uh, you could know that uh, when there's likely spike, imagine there's a spike in the month of January or uh, July, then uh, you could uh, uh, likely request uh, additional resources during that month, or uh, you could uh, assign contractors specifically for those months. And uh, details on times to review and type of vulnerability are very helpful. What we realized over time was uh, uh, certain, uh, by looking at uh, what type of application, what type of vulnerability, uh, you could learn that uh, oh, okay, now I have Ruby on Rails. That's likely to have cross-site scripting. Oh, this is a PHP application. This is likely to have remote code execution. Uh, and then you could use that to train your internal security engineers uh, on that information. And then you could also avoid a lot of deduplication. So after some time, what we did was we looked into some of uh, our uh, review data. So what we found was um, uh, our third party endpoint uh, uh, developers uh, uh, can uh, integrate with uh, separate APIs. Now, uh, we realized that some of the, the developers used the uh, same endpoints, and then it was reviewed by uh, multiple engineers along the same timeline. So we were able to whitelist that internally, so, we have, uh, so that if someone reviews um, an endpoint, and then after a certain time, when another developer, uh, uh, another external developer, uh, tries to use the same endpoint, the reviewer is made aware of it. Uh, we have certain cases also where uh, people hash all the third party uh, uh, JavaScript libraries and others, so they could uh, compare that and see if the <coughs> library has been previously reviewed by someone. Yes, uh, evangelization and uh, educating the entire process. So publish the document both internally and externally if you have internal uh, third party uh, uh, guideline for your internal developers and for external uh, cases like app exchange uh, we keep on uh, publishing it and we sell it to uh, our uh, Salesforce Dreamforce event and then uh, uh, also uh, uh, OWASP is a good way we have some links to OWASP uh, documentations uh, document all good and bad examples uh, that's very helpful too and uh, bring education, isn't that all uh, OWASP is about? So we try to uh, uh, help uh, our uh, developers too. And then we also do uh, weekly office hours uh, to, uh, for any developer, any third party uh, uh, developer who wants to develop in our platform, they could schedule time with uh, any of our engineers. We have uh, uh, each office hour is 30 minutes and we have uh, six office hours weekly. Uh, they come out, talk about false positives, and uh, we verify uh, architectures with them. And then, yeah, as I said, uh, automation is uh, very, very helpful. Uh, security engineers have a natural tendency to automate. Uh, in the beginning, it might be manual, but as the number of requests starts coming in, it might become very difficult as you uh, scale. Uh, automation is very, uh, very, very pivotal. Uh, so collect all this information into a unified system and uh, staff it for uh, 
less interesting stuff like metrics and uh, uh, operational support. Uh, and it's also he helpful that you provide some self-service tool. So if you have third-party provider, tell them, okay, we require you to run OWASP app scan, or we require you to run PMD scan and submit the report to us. So before the, before the app even comes to you, uh, they would know what their security status is, uh, and then you could reduce some of the issues. And also, uh, creating an operation team is very, very helpful. Uh, as I said earlier, as the number of requests keeps on increasing, it's very difficult. The cost of a security engineer and time of them is more valuable. So uh, what we realized is, uh, as we had an operation team, the number of requests that comes to your security engineer team uh, reduces greatly. Uh, so some of the common responses they could handle. And internally, what we also do is uh, uh, we ask uh, all the third party providers to run scan and then submit the scan report to us. So the operation team will look into the scan report and ask for false positive or ask them to remediate it. And then only they'll push the submission to our team. If there's no operation team, then what will happen is their request will go back in the queue. By the time a security engineer takes, looks at it probably a week or two weeks from now, then you have a huge wait time and then they'll, you, they might flag the same issue that's being flagged by an automation scanner. Now, these are some of the really good tools we use both internally uh, and we, uh, we also recommend you to start using it. Uh, Valen Report for Security Management, uh, this open source by Salesforce. We have Tim Bach here uh, who actually uh, developed it. Uh, and it's, it's a pretty helpful tool. It has metrics and uh, you can have um, all the review information. Uh, uh, and then uh, for source code analysis, Breakman, Bandit are more language specific for Ruby and Python respectively. Uh, PMD is a good uh, tool but has a like, lot of false positives. Uh, you can also look at vendors like Checkmax, uh, which is uh, which is what we use uh, in <coughs> and it's very helpful. Uh, for dependency analysis, uh, you can use uh, OWASP dependency check, a uh, pretty good tool. Uh, for web app scanning, uh, you know OWASP app, uh, we require all all our viewers if they submit if they are developing a web application, we ask them to submit OWASP app scan. Uh, and then we uh, we do we also use internally both Nikto and Nmap, very effective tools. Just a quick note on this: we do not endorse any vendors here. Um, do not take that as something that we are blessing. Yeah, These yeah. are just examples. Please find the best tool for the job. Yeah, but we recommend all any of the open source solution. <laughs> so now for question time. Uh, there's going to be a microphone coming around the room, so. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. So I just got one question. Like, you know, as you require third-party developer to submit you some security reports or scanning report that is generated by, you know, uh, whatever tools, mm -hmm. how do you validate that it's really the report targeting the real application? Could I just you know, make a fake application and run the scanner? I mean... Well, it's going to be <laughs> blank, right? Yeah, so we've included the required documents as part of our baseline, but we still assess. You trust, but verify. So yeah. it's great to get that ahead of time. The primary purpose of something like that for us is so that we can get those issues as far left in the process as possible. Mm -hmm. If you submit to us a really um, high vulnerability ZAP report, Hopefully, you've looked at the report you submitted us and have a reason that you've ignored everything. Or you've fixed everything, you have, you've given us a clean report. Um, if you submit us something that doesn't correspond with reality, that will be found out. And then also, we run the scan uh, ourselves also. So we have a scan that uh, we, uh, we run from our side. Uh, the, on their application is it like, they submitted. Is it like automated, uh, you yeah. know, once the people submit, you scan it with your scanner or, you know, you do it manually? They submit one uh, from their side and we also scan it from our side and also goes through a manual review. It depends, is the answer. Whether it's the code packages we ingest, those are automatically scanned. Yeah. Whether it's the third party endpoints, we do a little more ve manual verification because we don't want to start auto hacking the internet. I said ten. All right. Thank you. Thank you.
I think this is a really great talk. Thank you Thank for you. sharing. Yeah. Um, this is the first I've heard about it, so that's, <laughs> that's pretty great. Um, I think not everybody has an app store, but we all have vendors that we need to evaluate, mm -hmm. and I think this technique applies. Um, it's really great how you're allowing us as security people to say yes safely more often by working with the vendors and helping them get better. Uh, can you say more about the checkup process? How do you keep that all organized and uh, triggers that are not just time-based, but there's changes in the apps? How do you even know that that happens? Yeah. Um, about that. So we've tried to keep this as broad as possible to cover vendors, to cover people who don't have source code. And that's kind of left this hard to answer. It the answer really depends on what data you can automatically collect. At Salesforce, we ingest code packages. We can count lines of code. We can count number of files. We can count number of vulnerabilities from our own static analysis. Um, that helps really drive risk. We can count installs. Frankly, what's important to your organization and how do you measure change? Because um, what you're building is a change management or a change detection engine in order to know when there's enough change to warrant new security review. You could have time-based also. Uh, you could use, make use of Walden report, and then you could have like a time-based one. Probably every six months, you look into the review, or a uh, year from now. Uh, we use uh, code lines for the package case, but uh, if you have external closed source vendors, you could have a time-based one. Time-based, impact-based. Yeah. If you can, collect automated metrics, um, change-based as well. Yeah. Did we answer your question? Any other questions? Uh, uh, thank you for the talk. It's very interesting. Um, I'm curious, have you guys uh, seen any corner cases? Like you have this process, some of it's automated, some of it's manual, there's some you know, uh, third party interaction. Have, have, uh, has there been any like corner cases where somehow these, uh, this process hasn't been enough to uh, you know, catch ones and twosies? That makes sense? So, yes, um, I can't speak to any specific instances of vulnerabilities that were missed by this process. Um, it depends on how, you, how often you re-review and what the goal is. So at Salesforce, the goal isn't to provide a certification or attestation of security for every app on the App Store. That would be a ton of work that would put us in a lot of um, interesting legal and ethical quandaries. We want to make sure that security is something that has been considered. We want to make sure that we have an ongoing commitment from this partner that we care to get that we care about security and that if something happens we'll fix it together. Um, we don't promise that so it's not something that we track but we do help drive incidents when they occur. If that answers your yeah, question. Yeah, it's Okay. Yeah. Okay. Security is never done. We're not going to find O days in Apache struts with this process. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. We're, we'll also be available if you want to talk to us off the record. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you all.